Up until now, we have analyzed the motion of objects that we treated as so-called point masses, where literally all of the mass of the object was treated as lying at a single point. This is obviously an unrealistic idealization. Real objects have spatial extent and come in various sizes and shapes, some regular and some highly irregular. The mass distribution within these extended objects might be smooth and uniform or highly non-uniform and lumpy. Moreover, sometimes we will be interested in simultaneously analyzing a large system of particles or objects. To deal properly with such situations, it is necessary to introduce a new physical quantity called the momentum, which is a vector that we traditionally denote with the symbol p. For a single point mass, the momentum is the product of the mass and the velocity vector. The form of Newton's second law that we have used so far, f equals ma, is actually only true for the special case of a point mass. The more general form of Newton's second law is that f equals dp dt, that is, that the force is equal to the time derivative of the momentum vector. This is applicable to either a single particle or to a system of particles. This more general form provides us the way to address extended objects or multiparticle systems. We will once again appeal to a calculus-like argument, breaking down an extended distribution into a large number of small elements, treating each element separately, and then summing the results. As part of this process, we will introduce the concept of the center of mass, a sort of mass-weighted average position for an extended object or system. Momentum is also the first of several special measurable quantities that we will discuss that obey special powerful rules called conservation laws. The other two quantities are energy and angular momentum. Conservation laws are principles that provide that the given measurable quantity remains unchanged during the evolution of a system with time, as long as certain requirements are met, essentially the requirement that the system remains isolated. With this restriction in place, the possible evolution of motion of a particle or system of particles is greatly restricted, simplifying its calculation. We will see how this can be used to our advantage in understanding what will happen. So suppose we have a point mass particle of mass m moving with a velocity vector v. We can introduce a quantity we call the momentum of that particle. I'll label it with the symbol p. And it's equal to the product of the mass times the velocity. This is something you've undoubtedly seen before. Now let's think about the dimensions of momentum for a moment. So dimensionally, momentum has uh, units of mass times the velocity. And so that's, uh, in SI units, the units of mass are kilograms. And then the units of velocity are meters per second. You can also express momentum dimensionally as the product of a force times time. And so again, in SI units, the units of force are the Newton, and the units of time is the second. Okay, so these are the SI units for momentum, two different ways of writing the same, uh, uh, the same dimensions. Now we've seen that for a single particle, we can write Newton's second law as the force is equal to the mass times the acceleration. Or equivalently, we can write that as the mass times the time derivative of the acceleration, dv dt. Now, if m is a constant, then I can rewrite this as f is equal to the time derivative of the mass times the velocity or equivalently as the time derivative of momentum, since mv is just equal to p. Okay? So I actually want to stress this. I'm actually going to put it in a box, because it's very important, that I can write Newton's second law, instead of f equals ma, as f equals the time derivative of the momentum. And this is actually where we'll see the momentum becomes very useful. Because it turns out that this form of Newton's second law is actually the most general form of the equation. 
because it's applicable not just to a single point mass, but also to a more complicated system, a system consisting of many masses, or a system where the mass is changing, or where mass is flowing, as in a fluid. In all of those cases, this form of Newton's second law is correct. F equals ma, which is probably more familiar to you, is actually a special case of this law for the case of a single point mass. So this is where we'll see the momentum is uh, quite a useful concept, especially as we start considering more complicated systems, uh, as, we'll, as we'll get to a little later in the course. What I'd like to do now, though, is to take a closer look at this equation, force is equal to the time derivative of the momentum. Whenever we have a relation involving a derivative like this, we can always also rewrite it in an equivalent integral form which can be very useful and give us a different way of looking at the same information. So let's take a look at that. So if I take this equation and integrate both sides with respect to time, then I can write that as the integral of f with respect to time is equal to the integral of the right-hand side dp dt with respect to time. And let's make this a definite integral. I'll go from time t1 to time t2 on both sides here. Okay. Now this right-hand side is just, so the integral of dp dt with respect to time is just p at time 2 minus p at time 1. And that is just the change in the momentum vector going from time 1 to time 2. Now this integral on the left-hand side, we give a special name. We call this the impulse. This name, impulse, calls to mind a short, sharp shock of some sort, but it can also refer to a weak force acting over a long interval. And notice here, the function f, the force f, is in general a function of time. Okay, so this doesn't necessarily mean a constant f. This can mean a force that's varying in time. And what this equation tells us is that the change in the momentum of a system doesn't depend on the detailed time dependence of f, but rather just on the integral of f. And so suppose I were to graph the force as a function of time going from time 0 to a time delta t. And suppose I had some complicated function that looked like that. The impulse is just the area under this curve. It's the integral of this function. That's the impulse. And the change in the momentum depends only on the area under this curve and not on the detailed shape of the curve. So what that means is that I can define an average force by choosing a constant force that has the same area as this example on the left. So suppose I calculated that and there's some constant force here. I'll call this F average going over the same time interval. The average force is that constant force which has the same area as the area under my F of t. So in other words, F average times delta t, which is the area on the right-hand side here, is equal to the integral of f of t dt integrated from 0 to delta t, okay, which is the area under this right-hand curve. And so my average force is just that integral f of t dt divided by delta t. And this is integrated from 0 to delta t. So that's my average force. We would now like to use Newton's second law to relate impulse to change in momentum. So again, let's look at our setup. We have an object, m, a velocity v. And let's say here the picture as t initial, 
and we have some initial velocity, and then a little bit later in time, we have a time t final. The moment the velocity has changed, and that's because throughout this time interval, we're applying an impulse. We can call this the i hat direction. Now, recall that our definition of impulse, it's a vector quantity. It's equal to the integral of the force. Now, when I write force of t, I mean force as a function of time. And that's our dummy variable t prime. It's not force times time, but force as a function of time. And we're integrating from the initial to the final time period. Now, here's where we use the second, the version of Newton's second law, which is that force causes the momentum of an object to change. So we can write this integral, t prime, t initial, t prime equals t final, of dp dt. I'll just make a note that we've now applied Newton's second law. And because we're using our dummy variable, dt prime, and you can see that the two dt primes cancel. And this just becomes the integral from t initial, t prime to t final of dp. And this is a pure differential. And so we end up with impulse is the momentum at t final minus the momentum at t initial. Now, recall, this is a vector integral. But a vector integral is just three separate integrals for each component. So each component of impulse satisfies this equation. For instance, the x component of impulse is how the x component of momentum is changing in time. Now, generally, when we write a final momentum in, in our final state minus the momentum during the initial state, we can call this the change in momentum. So down here, we would have change in the x direction. And so in conclusion, we now have an integral way of casting Newton's second law. We have that impulse causes momentum to change. And so we can see that the SI units of impulse are the same as the SI units of momentum which we saw before was kilogram meter inverse seconds. Let's consider a ball that is dropped from a certain height, hi, above the ground. And this ball is falling. It hits the ground. And it bounces up until it reaches some final height, h final. Now, when the ball is colliding with the ground, there are collision forces. And in this problem, what we'd like to do is figure out what the average force of the ground is on the ball. So we'd like to find the, and that will be the normal force, the average normal force on the ball during the collision. Now, if we look at this ball dropping, it's going to lose a little bit of energy because it's getting compressed at the collision. Let's look at an example of the actual ball dropping. As you can see in this high speed video, as the ball falls down, it collides with the ground. When it collides with the ground, it's com compressed. And then as it rebounds upwards, the ball expands back to its original shape, but it doesn't quite get to the same height. That's because when the ball is compressed, there's some deformation in the rubber structure of the ball. And it's not a completely elastic deformation. And so some of the energy is transformed into, first, different molecular motions, which turn into thermal energy that's radiated into the environment. Let's look, in particular, at the details of the collision. If we look at it in slow motion, what we have here, and I'll draw a picture, as the ball is colliding with the ground, the ball compresses, expands as it goes upwards. And so we can draw a free body diagram on the ball with a normal force and a gravitational force. Now let's choose our positive direction up. So now what we'd like to do is apply the momentum principle to analyze the average normal force. And our momentum principle 
remember, is impulse, the force integrated over some time during the collision is equal to the change in momentum. So what we'd like to do is identify the states that are relevant. So we'll have a state before. So what we'll do is we'll call this the before state. And that's right before the ball is hitting the ground. And we have an after state. And in the after state, the ball has now finished colliding with the ground, and it's now moving up with speed up. Now, again, we're going to choose positive up. Here, I'm representing things as speeds. Um, one of the things, we need some times here. So let's say that at t initial, is zero. This is our final time. We'll call this time the before time. We'll just call this t before, and this is t after. And then our integral is going from before to after of the momentum, and we can now apply the momentum principle. Well, this is a vector equation, and we've chosen unit vectors up. So what we have here is the integral of from t before to t after of n minus mg integrated over dt. And that's equal to the momentum at the y component of the momentum at t after minus the y component of the momentum. We don't have a vector here anymore. The y component of the vector t before. And so this is our expression of the momentum principle. Impulse causes momentum to change. Now we're assuming that the normal force is just averaging it. And so this integral simply becomes n average minus mg times the time of collision is equal to. Now in here, we can put the mass of the ball. We have the velocity. Now here's where we have to be a little bit careful. Because we're looking at the y component. We chose speed downwards. That's in the negative y direction. So we have minus, sorry, we're looking at the after. We have plus the after, because this is going in the positive j hat direction. And over here, we have negative mass, but it's going in the minus direction. So we have minus mv before. And so we get mass times v after plus v before. So our first result is that the normal force average, let's bring the divide through by delta t and bring the mg term over. So we have mva plus vb divided by delta t plus mg. So we see that if the collision time is very short, then this average force is a little bit bigger. A long collision time, the average force a little bit smaller. Now from kinematics, we already have worked out the problem that the speed for an object that rises to a height h final, this is the velocity afterwards, is just square root of 2g h final. And in a similar way, if an object is falling a height hi, the speed when it gets to the bottom is 2g hi. And so now we can conclude with these substitutions that the average force equals m times square root of 2g h final plus square root of 2g h initial over the collision time plus mg. And of course, the collision time we're saying is t after minus t before. And so that's how we can use the momentum principle to get an average expression for the normal force. Let's now extend our concept of momentum to a system of particles. Again, we need to choose a reference frame, so we'll have a ground frame. And let's consider n particles. Now, when we have a lot of particles, we need some type of notation. So let's use the symbol j, and it will go from 1 to n. And then our arbitrary jth particle will be moving. This particle will have mass mj. 
and it will be moving with the velocity vj. Now recall in our system we have many other particles. We can call that one one, this one, and we have lots of different particles in the system. And this just represents an arbitrary particle in that system. And the momentum of the jth particle is just the mass mj times the velocity vj. And again, we're assuming some fixed reference frame. So the total momentum of the system, we now have to add up the momentum of all the particles, all the way up to the nth particle. Now, when we make a sum like this, there's a standard mathematical summation notation, which we'll write like this. We'll do the sum, this capital sigma sin, of j goes from 1 to j goes to n, of the momentum of the jth particle. And that represents the sum j goes from 1 to n of mj vj. And this is what we call the momentum of the system. This is a vector sum. And now let's see how Newton's second law applies to the momentum of a system. Suppose that acting on our particles, for instance, here's our jth particle, we have a force Fj acting on the jth particle. Then we know that from Newton's law that the force will be also the sum of the forces on all the particles, F1, F2, plus dot, 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 plus Fn. So once again, we can write this as a sum, J goes from 1 to N, of the force on the jth particle. And that's the force on the summing of all the forces on all the particles in the system. But now we can apply Newton's second law. So Newton's second law is the statement that the force on the jth particle causes the momentum of the jth particle to change. And when we write that now, the total force on the system, j goes from 1 to n, is just the sum of the change in momentums. Because every single term, let's just look at that, t1 plus dp2 dt plus dot, 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 plus dp n dt. That's what we mean by the sum. We can rewrite this as d by dt of p1 plus p2 plus p3 plus dot, 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 plus pn. And what we see is that the total force is the derivative of the sum j goes from 1 to n of the momentum. But recall, this sum we've defined as the momentum of the system. So our conclusion is the total force causes the momentum of the system to change. Now, so far, all we've done is we've recast Newton's second law in this form. Our next step is to analyze the forces on the individual particles we have and apply Newton's third law. So we'll do that next.